Decorating Pages is a podcast dedicated to taking you behind the scenes of the designs of your favorite TV shows and films. Each episode, I'll be sharing design stories from some of Hollywood's most famous sets, interviews from set decorators, production designers, directors, and actors about creating the look of TV and film, about their design inspirations, and stories that take sets from page to screen. Hello, and welcome to Decorating Pages. I'm your host, Kim Wanup. Lot to talk about. We had the Golden Globes this past weekend. We, who, if you've listened to past interviews, Brian Stone Street, who uh, designed both sets, uh, coast to coast, unbelievable. And um, I thought the sets were great. I thought that they worked together really well. And I kind of feel like if the cameraman had moved over maybe just an inch or two, they would have seen, it would have like looked like they actually were together instead of Tina Fey being on one coast and Amy Poehler on another. I thought it looked really good though. Bravo to him for taking on that task and being able to design that. So bravo, Brian. Um, the other thing we have this week was the ADG nominations. The awards, I believe, will be held in April, and I have not heard how they're going to do that. I'm wondering if it's virtual or a very, very abbreviated audience. I don't know. Maybe just the nominees. I don't know how they're going to do it. But um, a couple, oh, always interesting who gets nominated, right? Um, a lot of people we talk to here, uh, their one hour period or fantasy single camera series, the nominees are Lovecraft Country, Perry Mason, The Crown, The Mandalorian, and Westworld. And I bring this category up because the Emmys put The Mandalorian in half hour and the ADG puts it in an hour. And I agree with the ADG, um, that's way over a half hour. So I'm glad that they recognize that because it's hard enough to go up against the Mandalorian, especially if you're a half hour. I mean, that's a good, like we should take bets, people. I mean, Mandalorian against the crown. That's, that's a tight, I don't know. That's going to be a good one. Um, one hour contemporary killing Eve Ozark, the flight attendant, the twilight zone and utopia television movie or limited series is Fargo, Hollywood, Little Fires Everywhere, The Alienist, and The Queen's Gambit, Half Hour Single Camera, Dead to Me, Emily in Paris, Mythic Quest, Space Force, and What We Do in the Shadows, Multicam is Ashley Garcia, Genius in Love, Bob Hart's Abishola, God, I'm so bad with names, uh, Family Reunion, The Neighborhood and Will and Grace, Abishola, Abishola, I'm oh, no, sorry, short format web series, Adidas, original superstar change is a team sport, Apple, uh, Camilla Cabriello, <laughs> it's a joke, Harry Styles, Falling, Taylor Swift, Cardigan, um, variety reality or competition series, Earth to Ned, Saturday Night Live, The Masked Singer, The Voice, and Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> a special place in my heart for that variety specials black is king the democratic national convention super bowl halftime the oscars and yearly departed period feature ma rainey's black bottom mank mulan news of the world and the trial of the chicago seven feature fantasy film birds of prey pinocchio tenant the midnight sky and Wonder Woman, contemporary feature film, The Five Bloods, I'm thinking of ending things, Palm Springs, Promising Young Woman, The Prom, animated feature, The Shaun, The Shaun the Sleep movie, The Shaun the Sheep, oh, <laughs> The Shaun the Sheep movie, Sheep, uh, Farmageddon, you know what's funny, I'm probably gonna have to watch that a million times, yeah, Onward, Soul, The Crudes, and Wolf Walkers. So there's all your nominees. Hoping I can talk James Pierce Connolly into coming back. 
maybe we do a little wrap up when it's over. I, I, I mean, I enjoy doing that with him because we drink while we do it. And uh, basically, we just call it as we see it. So I really like that. So I hope that uh, I'm going to hit him up for that if he's listening. <laughs> What am I watching? What's one I'm watching? I don't know. Sister Wives is back on, people. That's very important. I've been watching these people for like 15 years, 13 years they've been on. But that's reality TV. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but I must say, a fascinating study when you look at Mormon families living together and, yeah, their style is something. It's It's something. What else? Um, I'm watching that Alan Farrow documentary. You fucker. <laughs> you fucker. Unbelievable. He's unbelievable. He should be in jail. He should. Um, other than that, I'm still kind of living out of boxes. I mean, my babies are all unpacked. I don't have a kitchen. And um, it's, you know, dealing with the real world and design and waiting for pieces is so frustrating. <laughs> I need a construction and a set tech crew over here to finish this ASAP because I think it shoots tomorrow and uh, everybody else doesn't. So I don't know. It's really frustrating for everything not to be done at once like a set. I guess that's why what we do is magic and we just get it done. Unbelievable. So yeah. Again, this is uh, Jim Bissell who is an extraordinary production designer who has been designing since the early 80s and I am sure has influenced a generation of designers and decorators and illustrators and I'm sure of it. Um, In this episode, I drill him about the Twilight Zone movie because I loved that movie when I was little. I'm totally dorking out, so catch that. His feelings of designing heavy CGI films like 300 and Jumanji. He's worked six times with George Clooney, uh, films that include Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, Good Night and Good Luck, and his nominated film, his nominated ADG film, The Midnight Sky. His love of the film The Spiderwick Chronicles. He designed a five million dollar garage for Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. (laughs) We get to talk about that. He basically invented computer previs, on The Boy Who Could Fly, one of my secret favorite movies. He also gives us some just great insights into a ton of other films that he's designed. So I hope you enjoy. Um, I want to step back one second only because you did Twilight Zone. Which every time I, and there's John Lithgow again, every time I fly, I think of that. <laughs> My husband was like, you're sick. You're, de-. and I was like, no, I think of it. Every time I look out that window, I think of, of that, I don't know, so that animal or whatever. But the segment of the little boy who like mind controls and he lives in this like cartoony house scared the shit out of me when I was little. It's scary. You know? It's so frightening. And these, like, you know, infinity hallways that you designed and the, like, it's cartoony but not, it, like, these people are really living there. Like, what what type of research or inspiration did you have for that? I mean... Well, it's largely psychological. You know, it's funny, when I read the script, and Joe Dante gave me the script, and, uh, and it, was, uh, it was written as sort of a rundown ranch house you know, with big mm. hedges, that he lived in the, he lived in a Steven Spielberg neighborhood, but it was the decrepit house that nobody knew what was going on inside of. And, uh, and I read it and I, I said to, and, and, and in the script, he watches cartoons all the time. Right. And, uh, and, uh, I read it and I, and I said to Joe, you know, if he watches cartoons all the time and he's able to cre- recreate his own environment, why doesn't he live in a cartoon house? And I said, maybe we can find like an old Victorian or something that looks like, you know, it's viable, but then you realize it's, it's just a cartoon. And we'll put the cartoon in one of the cartoons that we see, and then you'll understand all this stuff. 
And there was a leap of faith on his part. He ran with it. He said, yeah, that's cool. Let's go wow. with that. I, I mean, it, it does. And even when they're driving up to that house, you know that something's not quite Weird. right. Something's a little off. But that when they all meet the kid in, in the little vestibule, it still looks like a house and you still got some like colonial furniture or whatever going on. And then the, the, uh, the scenes taking the woman upstairs and everything. And it, it it's petrified me. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that the girl, the sister with the, the sister with the mouth. Oh my God. Oh, that's, that's really scary. It and is. Rob, Bote Rob Bote's, uh, creatures were pretty, pretty out, outlandish. Yeah. And the spinning, cause you think it's going to be Tasmanian devil, like this weird animal. And then it's just this weirdo kind of wet creature and like it's just so gross. It's yeah. I love it. I loved I love and the kick the can is just makes me cry too. <laughs> I, yeah. I had not seen Twilight Zone in so many years and I'd forgotten that first that first um, Albert Books and and um, Dan Aykroyd, I completely forgot their little segment. But... Oh yeah, that, well, that was directed by John Landis, and then of course there's the infamous Dick Morrow one. Yeah, well, yeah, which, which, which is a tragedy. Yeah, and and I hard did, to watch. I not, incidentally, I did not do that one. No, oh, that. because of timing or because of it wasn't here or. I was a production manager on Kentucky Fried Movie. Oh, so then it didn't. You didn't want to. No, we didn't want to. Okay. <laughs> we weren't into it. Uh, well, it's a, hey, at least you got to not do it. <laughs> you didn't have to. Yeah, do it. no, I, I, I was very fortunate not to have to be out there. That was really tough on everybody. Yeah. Um, so, do all of these movies that you get to, do, to design so brilliantly, when it leads up to like a Jumanji and you start really diving into like, more of the CGI and, and, and everything. Do you find designing more challenging because of these elements that you, you can't, I mean, because it's, no, the thing is, remember this. Um, oh, speaking of Ron Ka, uh, very shortly after Twilight Zone, uh, I was I was doing Falcon and the Snowman, I think, which was you know straight drama. Yeah, really it, it wonderful really, really movie. Interesting. I got to work with John Schlesinger, which was really a treat. Wonderful film. Um, but Ron wound up working for a company called Digital Productions. It was founded by John Whitney Jr. and Gary Demos, and they were out hawking to the various studios the, the whole idea of moving forward with creating imagery inside a computer. This is 1984. Hmm. And, uh, and they finally sold the idea to Lorimar. Mm -hmm. And so The Last Starfighter was born. And Ron uh, suggested to Nick Castle that he talk to me about being the production designer. So I talked to them and, uh, and, uh, and I really wanted to do it because I wanted to learn about this computer what Ron was doing. I, I really wanted to see what, what this was all about. Right. So I wound up being hired as a production designer. And the more I worked, you know, I, 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 I found the, uh, the trailer park. We started designing the trailer park sets and the, mm -hmm. know, the sign and all that. That was really cute. But what I found was I was basing a lot of my designs off what Ron was doing for the computer. So I suggested to him, I said, you take the production design credit. I'll be the art director. And so if you ever see the credit opening credits to the last starfighter it's really weird because ron gets the credit just before me as production designer single card credit then 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 art director gets single card credit wow uh, why Laura Mari did it this way then i get my single card credit and then you move on to the producers and the, and the director wow and it's uh, and it's sort of bizarre but that was the reason why you know in the tradition of william cameron menzies i i said look I, i'm not designing a lot of this stuff i'm basing it on what you're designing and so you should be the production designer and anyway the, the long and the short of it is that started my love affair with realizing how computer imagery is just another tool and the most important thing is to design the dramatic imagery that you need and then pick the right ways of executing so in your experience, do you like it better when there is 
the design first and then the computer comes in or if they've already worked with uh like either it's an illustrator no, you, you're, no you, you don't even have to qualify that there's no question design first yeah build yeah, yeah. in the computer and not only that but throughout my career it's always been design and see what the computer can do at this particular point in, point in time even 300 we use traditional backings right well, you know, it, it was all designed. It was what does the shot require, and how do we make sure that it stylistically fits in with the rest of the movie? But it was not. Oh, we're all going to we're going to do all this in the in the computer. Peter Bart was the when he wrote the review of uh, Three Hundred in, in uh, Hollywood Reporter. He said, uh, "Well, this is the future. You know, are we just sort of paint everything green and and uh, and throw people in front of a green screen?" I said, "Well, then why do we have a four and a half million dollar construction budget?" Right, right. You know, it's like. You're, you're insane. Right. That's insulting. <laughs> That's insulting. We, we, you front load the design. You make sure you've got it all worked out before you right. actually do anything, and then you can do it really cheaply. Because you know exactly where the handoff is between foreground and background and middle ground, and you know how to design to accommodate that, that handoff so that it's not noticeable. Which now, in elevating the design, like how they're doing Mandalorian and everything with the screens and the surrounding, you know. Yeah, you're really front loaded with those LED screens. Otherwise right. You don't get it. Right. But it still has to be dressed. It still has to be designed. Yeah. It still has no, to no, be. And, and not only that, but, uh, well, like on Midnight Sky, we use the LED screens. That's why everything is so reflective in, inside the, uh, the barbell. Oh. Those are all. Those are very reflective sets with LED screens and uh, with plates that are shot in Iceland. Wow. Did you go up to Iceland? Oh, yeah. You know, I, did, I scouted it. Did you love it? I love Iceland. <laughs> Iceland's one of the most fantastic places on earth. Mm. Uh, how long were you shooting up there? We shot a little over three and a half weeks, I think. Mm. Oh. Did the plane crash and everything, was that here? Nope. That was no, it? that was in Iceland. That was on, on the glacier. Oh wow! I had no, I I didn't see that whole glacier thing coming <laughs> when he wakes up in the water. I didn't see that coming at all. I was like, yeah, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's sort of an action adventure sequence sort of thrown in there. Yeah. Uh, but it's still effective. A lot of people really like the sequence. I did. I did a lot in in the reality of it. Just of like, oh yeah, this probably would have happened. Like <laughs> another bad thing to happen, but it probably would have happened. And then I, I just always think of the dressing of it and like uh, everything. How many takes did they have to do? How many times did they have to reset that room not to tilt or? It was on, you know, it was pre-programmable because it was on a hydraulic uh, gimbal, mm -hmm. and so you can, you know, you pre-program pre-program the uh, the. Uh, the positions and, and, and the reset really didn't take very, very much time at all. The, the big one outside, when he comes outside and you're on that really large set that has all the ice flows, they're also on hydraulic gimbals. And they're in uh, like a, we built a weir and built a four or five foot uh, deep uh, pool underneath so that as they separated and moved, you could see the water. That's but, beautiful. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, that's all on stage. But the exterior of that, when they first come across it in the daylight, that's on the glacier. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, how long was the prep for that whole film? Was it long? I think I started uh, I started on it at the end of, very end of March, beginning of April of... Uh, 2019? 2018. And then, uh, and then we started shooting in the second week of October. Oh. Uh, in Iceland, and then we came to the stages uh, at Shepperton in December. And that is your third. That's your third project with George Clooney, right? Because you have six. 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 Wait. Oh, yeah, leather Leatherheads. I forgot about that. Confessions one. of a Dangerous Mind. Good, good night, night and good, good luck. luck. Leatherheads, mm -hmm. uh, Suburbicon, Monuments oh, Men, sorry. and Midnight Sky. I didn't realize you directed those. Oh. I mean, does the guy ever get a bad script? I mean, I don't know. Even Leatherheads wasn't popular, but it's still a good movie. If you're a football fan, that's a good movie. That's I love it. It's a good it. movie, and it looks good, too. I think Jan did a fabulous job. I that. love that movie. I think it's really good. I think it's fun. I think it's stupidly funny, but it's funny. Mm -hmm. I don't know. How did you get hooked up with him? 
I mean, Jan had said like, well, we. I mean, it was George Clooney, but it wasn't like a director George Clooney. Like they that you hardly had any money on Good Night and Good Luck. We had no money, no money. I, as a matter of fact, I just to pay the rent, I had to go off and do some commercials while we were shooting. Oh my god! Oh my god! But because I was, I think I was making like a hundred bucks over scale or something like that. On it. Oh my god! What is wrong with our industry? <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, that's just part of what you have to do. It's, it's like they're career decisions. You look at something, if you really love material you want to do, then you do it. You don't have to have a certain amount of money or... But don't you think at a certain point of design and production designers should get royalties? Yeah, dream on. <laughs> I'm not yeah. saying it's going to happen, but shouldn't it happen? Shouldn't yeah, you get something? Uh, nobody below the line. I mean, DPs don't get it. No. The only people that get it is because of their connections to the director are the first ADs. Yeah. They, they yeah. get, they the get it. The ADs get it. And we, we get royalties. I mean, we do, you know, we have the post... Uh, in our in our unions. In, in our pension funds. So, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's still... You get a little bit, but it, it's not like... Not like a writer or an actor. No. I mean, I, I acted in... Uh, I wrote one script that actually was produced, and I still get royalty checks for that. There you go. Yeah, it wasn't even all that you good. You should have been. You should have been a little bit nicer, maybe, to George when he gave away a million dollars to all of his friends. <laughs> I, I haven't been a friend for that long. <laughs> We've only known each other since 2000. And so. Oh, but here's a story. You want to hear the good story? Yeah, yeah. On how I met George. <laughs> so, uh, 2000, I. Uh, I wound up doing a project called Cats and Dogs. And there was a producer on it that was brought in by Warner Brothers, who really was sort of not there very much, but nonetheless, he has a really interesting eye for material. A guy named Andrew Lazar. Mm. I like Andrew a lot. Anyway, we finished Cats and Dogs, and it was a really, really tough shoot. A really tough shoot. We had a first time director, um, and the producer, the actual line producer, uh, Christofaria, I mean, he just worked his butt off trying to keep things together and keep keep things on on track, and it was really hard. See, some projects you just can't get it together. <laughs> uh, God. But nonetheless, uh, you know, it went on to be Warner Brothers' largest grossing picture of all time in England, and it made a lot of money, and it spawned a sequel. Despite the fact that uh, I can't even remember the. the uh, Warner Brothers production exec who hired Larry Gudeman, the director, wound up not liking Larry Gudeman at all and tried to get him sort of blacklisted. And the next company to hire Larry was uh, New Line because they can't stay at Warner Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, that's a little bit of gossip from the inside. But, uh, but, uh, but Andrew had this script. He said, I want you to read it. And he gave me Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. And I thought, what? Oh, I love that. It was my favorite script I'd ever read. I thought, this is a fantastic project. And I told him, yeah, I'm in. And so, you know, months later, I read where he's up in Montreal and, and Brian Singer's directing it and uh, Francois again's designing it. You know, I just like, well, that's the way it happens. Mm -hmm. I get a call from him. Uh, Francois again just really can't stomach Brian S Singer anymore. Will I come up and replace mm -hmm. Francois? Who was a really good designer, incidentally. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, but but what was happening was he was getting absolutely no feedback from Brian at all. Brian was locked inside his room, you know, doing his uh, doing, like, doing his research. Something. Yeah. So uh, so I went up, and you know, it was five weeks from shooting, and there was like 114 sets and locations. Three sets, three locations had been picked, and you know, and no designs had been approved. So. Oh, you know, we get on it, and I knock on Brian's door, and I'm outside his room, and I'm saying, well, Brian, you know, he said, I can't talk. And I said, that's fine. I tell you what, on the day of shooting, I'll walk you through what my thoughts were. You can shoot it that way or not, you know, and but we're going to go ahead and start picking locations and uh, and, uh, and doing the movie. What a good... And that's fine, he said. So, so we, we work our little butts off for a week and a half, and then all of a sudden the accountant who's this English fellow, a very honorable man, comes up to me with, a, with an envelope full of cash. He said, you have not been paid yet. This is all you're going to get. Take it. Do you have your return trip ticket? And I went, yeah. He said, use it because 
something was something was wrong. Something was very amiss with the financing of the project. Anyway, the next day, <laughs> all he did you cash. Yeah, get cash. <laughs> I think it was about ten thousand dollars in cash. So, uh, so I, I fly back to LA with this wad full of cash and don't hear anything from anybody for months. And then I get a call from Andrew again. He goes, "I think I've got George Clooney interested in doing the movie." Confessions. And I thought, oh, whoopsie do. Just, you know, the best <laughs> script in Hollywood is now going to be a vanity project for some bobbleheaded, you know, right. movie. Uh, I, you know, right. I, was, I, can't, I was so pissed off. And, and, and Andrew sort of proudly said, and he's agreed to meet with you. And I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah whoop de do. Yeah. He's so anyway, lucky to meet over, with me. <laughs> yeah. I went over to George's house and started talking with him about it. And I got to say, he blew me out of the water. He was so knowledgeable. He was he understood the material so well. Mm. His ideas were incredible, and his depth and knowledge of film was oh, that's just exciting. I had no idea. Oh, the guy was so exciting. smart and so and and, and capable and, uh, and just amazing. And I was super charged up. I walked out of I walked out of his house and got into my car, and I, I was walking on two two inches of air. <laughs> I'd never been that excited about a project. And uh, and then uh, we did the whole thing, and never once did my enthusiasm flag. I mean, we had so much fun doing that show, and we did some really complicated, very ambitious stuff. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, because I rewatched it again. The, they're not every single shot is tinted, or is that like a sepia, like... It depends on the mood of whether he's in killer mode or if he's like on the gong show. And so that in and out of tinting these colors, like I'm sure that was discussed, but then how does that affect how you design it? It wasn't discussed well, and that is the only downside to the whole production. Oh. Was that Tom, Tom Siegel, the, who was a very good director of photography, but he was also just learning digital manipulation and he unilaterally did a lot of that stuff without talking to me, without talking to Rene Brill, who was the, uh, the costume designer. And it used to drive us crazy. Uh, well, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I talked to George about it. And he understood, but you know, he, he had a lot of faith in Tom. Um, so then it, it that, wasn't even, that was it. It wasn't the, even but planned. No, I, I didn't have anything to do with that. And, uh, wow. And, to, and Tom would Tom would even say, just paint everything just so so that there's nothing this close to flesh tones because I'll get in and manipulate the color afterwards. And I was like, you know, that's my job. Please. Yeah, you got to tell me what coloring is yeah, going to be. Yeah, you know, because I, 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 I do that, that sort of thing. And, I, and I, I'm excited to do it. And uh, I just don't really like this attitude of just paint it. Just paint it all green, and I'll grab the green and ch change it to whatever color I want to. Then why am I That's, here? Why am I yeah. <laughs> just... But there were some really amazing in-camera shots. I don't know if you remember them or not. Oh, yeah. Remember? Oh, yeah, yeah, remember yeah. Remember when, he's, uh, when he's, uh, he's, he's sitting there talking and Drew's in the bathtub? Yeah. And she's talking about her dream? Yes. And then you move all... The, the, the camera moves all the way into his eyes yeah. after she says, you know, the bullshit of dating. He goes... Holy fuck. Yeah. Holy shit. The bullshit of dating. She goes, what? And you hear her voice fade, and then the camera starts pulling out, and you're in a completely different set. Yeah. it's That's all in one shot. That's real. It's really great um, because it, it feels like an older film, too. Mm -hmm. I got a, a, the, the photography of it or like and the design, it just feels like an older film. That you're watching like come out in the 90s i think that too lended so much to even when he's in like berlin and everything i it, it the colors and everything was so fantastic and and most of the and the, obviously the camera moves lend to that oh the other one that's a really great in camera shot was when they're in the stage and uh, they're doing the auditions for the gong show and, he, and the and the girl sitting there with the I I had a hammer. Right, right. And then the stage door opens and there's the there's the church from the first murder. Oh right. And then all of a sudden the bullet blows Kabuki. her guitar apart, she collapses and there he is with the rifle. Yeah. That's all in camera. We built we actually overnight we oh, shot the we shot the first murder and then we built a little stage right there so that when he opens the door you see that in the background. So it's all one shot fluid. There's no tape. There's no 
cuts. There's no. There's no cut. There's no green screen. There's not. There's no. It's all right there. Oh my god, that's right beautiful. And, and the and then I think it goes into that giant uh, mural of his mother. Well, that's a backdrop. Or backdrop. That's when he's backstage at the Gong Show, and all everything's turning into his life. It's yeah. turning, you know, and and the mom figures preeminently because she's the one who dressed him up as a girl because <laughs> he killed his sister. Yeah. His umbilical cord killed the sister. It's, That's just it's an awesome movie. It's an and awesome George, movie. You know, George was so fearless. You know, he he was. You, you try to talk a lot of other directors into those kind of shots, and they're afraid of how they're going to their hands are going to be tied when they're uh, cutting it together mm. later on. But George, he's a very assured director. He's a really really great guy to work with, especially when you want to try something pretty daring. And did you, you were on location here and then in Europe? Because you have four different no, decorators. No, we, we just did Montreal. Oh, uh, we did Montreal and, uh, and then um, we had a, uh, a week, a week in LA and uh, three days in Nogales and then Tucson, Arizona. Oh, because you have and, four And, and, and you know, that, that question you asked about the uh, set decorators, a lot of that comes from the uh, the Montreal system, where a lot of people are called set decorators. I, I'm not even completely oh. sure how that works, but um, oh shoot, what was it? Uh, Angelia mm -hmm. was she did most of the work, uh, and and uh, the the other two, um, Dominique yep. Goslin and Louis. Uh, I I don't even know who they are to be honest. I think Maybe they were they on her crew. And, they were on her crew, and they just took they they sort of opportunistically took a set decorator credit. And I, then uh, Robert, Robert did all the LA stuff. I thought maybe it was like reshoots or just some sort of like freak no. thing. Cause you don't there usually. Were no, there were no reshoots. Okay. So did you then go right into Good Night and Good Luck? No, 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 that, that, Good Night and Good Luck was 2004. So that was three, three or four years later. I, in between I did, uh, I did Fifty First Dates and Hollywood Homicide. Oh, wait. Yeah, I'm so sorry. You did Hollywood Homicide and The Ring Two. It looks like The Ring Two and also Three Hundred. And Three Hundred. No, 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 no. Well, Three Hundred. They right have. After connected up. Man, you. I mean, I. You haven't stopped. <laughs> You don't stop. And when it looks like, oh, like, oh, there's a little gap, you were probably working on, like, Mission Impossible for so long and or, like, I'm assuming 300 took a long time. No, not, no. What? It started, uh, I think I started in, uh, you know, I was on it for less than a year. Really? Yeah. Man. No, it, it, but it was, what was really interesting, I, I mean, I love working with, Zach's an amazing guy to work with because it's a little bit like working with a Ridley Scott or a Joe Johnston. Mm. He's a really good artist, you know. He does his own storyboards and and his thumbnails are fantastic. You know exactly what he's got in his mind, and so it's it's a great shorthand for being able to. That's you know. the communication with the director is so vital and so like being on the same page and or hopefully the same book, <laughs> the same script, and like yeah. making sure you're all together. Do you um, do you try to keep with the same directors? I mean, as much as we can. I know that we can't schedule wise, but are you always like, well, if George calls, I'm available, or you know, like? Yeah, I'd like I'd like I'd like from to try to give me a little advance warning. Sometimes he doesn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, and it's tough because you know production designers are brought in at the very very beginning, and and it's very unsure. They don't know where they're going to shoot it. They don't know. Uh, if they could put the package together and, and get a green lit, you know, you, you just, I can't tell you how many movies I worked on that just never got made. Right. And, uh, and it's, it's always tough. You invest a lot of your life's blood into them and, and right, it's yeah. difficult. And no, I'd, I'd always prefer, I'd always prefer to work with George or I, I'd like to work with Zach again. If he'd ever, if he'd ever wanted to collect, cause I loved working with Zach. It's such a special film, yeah. 300. It's so, like, your imagination is, like, blown the first time you see that movie. With all of the action and the design of it, and it just seems unreal, like cartoons came to life or something. It's so beautifully done. Yeah. It's one of those, one of those films, though, where, and Good Night and Good Luck is, 
to, to a degree as well. It's limitation dictates style. Mm -hmm. We had no money, you know, and Alan Horn, who was, uh, you know, who was responsible for Greenlighting 300, said he didn't like violent movies. If it was, if it was going to be R-rated, he wasn't going to give us a penny over 59.9 million. You know, it was, he, and, uh, and we had to find ways to economize. And it was in finding those ways to economize that we evolved this really unique book. That's incredible, because yeah. it seems like every penny that studio made went into that movie. It just seems like, uh, I don't know. I, yeah. I, I think seeing it, I remember seeing it the first time and being like, this is, this is mind-blowing. I just thought it was gorgeous. It, it almost, to me, was taking like the Matrix and, and, and the next level, like you were saying with spaceships. Like I feel like that took those camera moves and everything to a different genre and it was just a gorgeous film. I don't know. I really like 300. And did I? Th I can't believe it's not. It's got to be R-rated, right? No. It is R-rated. It yeah. is R-rated. That's, why, that's oh. why we had to do it for so cheap. Because Zach said, "There's no way I'm making this a PG-13 movie." No. Because if, if he had made a PG-13, uh, Alan Horn was perfectly willing to give eighty million dollars to make it. Wow. Well, I think he made the right choice. I mean, it still made a lot of but money. No, there's no question. That was his vision. That's yeah. what he saw. Um, in doing Good Night and Good Luck. Were there just tons and tons of camera tests for to get the values of your color palette? No, no, not at all. No, I, I, I carry, I carried a uh, um, contrast filter around with me, or I just squinted. And the one thing that I made George agree to because we didn't have any money. Two th two things help. Uh, good night and good luck. One was this was again limitation dictates style. George wanted to be able to chase his actors. He did not want to have to storyboard and cut every time we went to a different location. Mm -hmm. So I had to look at what the principal thematic material was, which is the juxtaposition of news and entertainment, and the, ro the role of uh, corporate America in what it is that we see. And, uh, and I had to look at how we set that up and created the imagery that we needed to, to create and part of what I did was I anchored a lot of the various little places, little sets. I anchored them with quotes from actual photographs of Edward R. Morrow at his little desk, or Edward R. Morrow doing this or that. So you 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 were constantly quoting historical photographs mm -hmm. to to establish the veracity of this of this. And then you're moving around, and what you're doing is you're moving around a stage complex uh, uh, that basically always has the newsroom right here but you see stuff in the background that's entertainment you know people are singing or you have uh, you know a wardrobe rack going to another stage where you know days of our lives is being shot the thing that really i i was amazed by well first of all that was one of the first movies that was the first movie with george because i started working in 3d on uh, the ring two mm. So I built, I built, I started evolving the designs in the computer. Uh, and I would go over to George's house and we'd just sit and we'd say, well, if I want to chase somebody from here to here, what, do, what does it look like? And I'd show him. And then if he had changes, we changed it in the computer. I'd go, okay, well, we'll move this, we'll move this wall, we'll give it a little shorter tracking and we'll stack the images up so that you see this, this, and this. And when you look through the glasses, you'll see the control room and then you'll see the stage and then that's, that'll be the context for that shot. And we did that for weeks and weeks. And then when he finally got really satisfied with the set, I built him a little cardboard model, uh, a foam core model. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so he kept that with him so that when he was planning shots, he always had it with him. The result was we built that set in under six weeks and we didn't change a nail. And you know and I know that's where you spend money. Yeah, well, yes. It's in changes. And, and not only that, it was all plotted out. Jan knew exactly what she had to get. That's nice. Well, when you don't have money, Set. you have to, you really, you really, you have way. to do it. Yeah. Because there's no time to get like, oh, I'm going to get these two sofas. And <laughs> well, yeah, you've got 22 days to shoot it. You know, you, you don't have that much time. Wow. A seven and a half million dollar movie. Wow. I mean, George, that was like one week on ER. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 
it's such a beautiful film and and the acting is so superb in it I, it's I, really good i always pronounce that guy's name wrong state john i forget the lead guy's name which part? Me out. The, who plays Edward R. Murrow. Oh, uh, Davis, Davis Stratherm. Stratherm? Stratherm. Yeah. Stratherm. Yeah, and David was in Spiderwork Chronicles, too. Yes, which I watched a little bit with my boys who were kind of freaked out. <laughs> but they yeah, were, two years old, I can't imagine. I know. I, they're really, I don't know. I was like, I got to watch this. You guys want to check it out with me? <laughs> they watched a little bit of it, and then they were mad that I that we had to eat dinner and turn it off. But I had never seen it, and I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I guess it's fine for them to have on in the background, but then they were really into it. And then I was like, oh my god, is that Nick Nolte? This is awesome, this movie's yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> um, what a fun... And your, your question about the set decorator on that one, too. Yeah, here's what happened there. Was, oh, yeah. um, it's very ironic. Uh, so we, we did the pitch, you know, that... Paramount sort of sort of saw this as their Harry Potter, or potentially could be their Harry Potter. So they, we we did a fairly elaborate pitch to Brad, uh, Brad Gray, mm. and uh, and he said, "Look, this is a very nice pitch. Everything's beautiful, but I don't. You guys can make the movie, but all I care about is that we don't go through what we went through on um, Charlotte's Web." where they had not planned adequately, where they did, they went into production before they had their third act. Oh. And, yeah, it was bad. Well, well that's bad. Guess what? That happened. We went into production before we had our third act. Oh. And, uh, and there were all sorts of conflicts with the director. At one point, uh, the head of production flew up and sat all the production, uh, head, uh, the department heads down and said, we're replacing the director. And then they changed their mind. Oh my God, and, how embarrassing. Uh, it was a night, nightmare. And then eventually what happened was I left the project. They shut down early because they didn't have a third act. Mm. And uh, and so what happened was I was doing Leatherheads when Kathy fired it back up again and they wanted to shoot parts of the third act. And Ed Vareau did that, designed that. So I think that's where that other set that That's where they come in. in. Yeah, that was the U.S. one. But it was, you know... I'd asked Jan to do it primarily because this was supposed to be sort of the Americanization of European, old European myths. Mm. And I just wanted that, you know, I, I love Paul. Paul Oat was, uh, was the side decorator on 300. And I knew we'd have to get a match when we went up to Montreal to shoot it anyway. So uh, Jan and, and I talked to Paul and just said, would you mind being the match? Because we'd love to have you on it. And was more than happy to do it. Oh, so awesome. I had two, you know, that's world fantastic. class decorators yeah. working on that show, which was fantastic. Yeah. I, <laughs> you didn't have and, to do anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, was, and, and also, let me just say, I had uh, Isabel Gay, who was uh, the supervising art director, who was also on 300, who was on Spider Man Chronicles, and on Confessions. And She's a magnificent it, supervising art director. There's an, there's, um, there was an art director I kept seeing her name also, Krista Morano, was that? Or... Krista Monroe. Monroe. I saw yeah. that you had a long working relationship, too, with her. Well, it, a... she, came, she came bursting onto the scene on Confessions of a Dangerous Mind because I had asked Gay Buckley, who oh, had worked with me several times as a uh, supervising art director, to do the U.S. portion of uh, Confessions. And two weeks before we were coming back, she had been asked by Kevin Costner to design oh, Costner's Western. It's going to be her first picture. Is I forget that. our um, Dance of the Wolves. No, it was uh, it was Jeffrey Dean Croft. Uh, I can't I can't remember uh, the name of the movie, but she she called and said, "Oh, Joe, I'm so sorry. Would it be possible?" And she and she had lined up Krista, and I'd known Krista just from our you know from meetings. So I was happy with that. And, uh, and Krista has done just about everything I've done in country since then. I mean, when I work in Canada and in, in England, I use Helen Jarvis. And she's fantastic. I just, I just had a two-hour Zoom meeting with her today. It's so important to work with people you like. Yeah. <laughs> it really makes such a difference. I mean, and having as a designer or as a decorator working with designers again and again, 
it's just so great because you just you get your shorthand and you you can kind of read each other's minds. <laughs> Jan's done more movies with me than anybody else. I think she, we've done six, six I together. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, she's so phenomenal. I she's just great. Before her was Linda DeSena. Linda DeSena, who God, Linda DeSena is like, I, I don't even know. I don't even know how she's, she's a goddess. She is. I when I started this podcast, she is the still the number one name on my wish list. She's, well, she's in town. Why don't you call? Did you call her? No, I mean I tried with the agents to get her info, and I don't know if she wasn't interested and or they just didn't ask her or whatever. But I'll send her an email and ask her. Oh, she, we usually we usually try to have at least one or two meals a year together. Oh, and, uh, if, if she's you. Retired. She's got, I mean, the amount of incredible work and inspiring work that she has done is just, it's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. <laughs> we did, uh, what did we do together? We did Rocketeer together, Someone to Watch Over Me, which is also a really good-looking movie. If you think oh, uh, yeah. I, that's, there's Tom Berenger, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Harry, she did Harry and the Hendersons, Harry and, and she also did Fal Falcon, Falcon and, and the Snowman. Falcon and the Snowman, right? Yeah. Just, I love Falcon and the Snowman too, and I probably was too young to have watched that movie when I did, but I always fell in love with Sean Penn very early on in my life. <laughs> Just, he's brilliant in that movie. Ah, uh, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. He's so good in that movie, and the ending. It's uh I love it. I mean, I love Boy You Can Fly too, so I go back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, now here's an interesting <laughs> side note too. On Boy Who Could Fly, I was the production designer and the second unit director. I designed all the the, the flying sequences in the end, and uh, and I had just I had come off of doing the last Starfighter, and I thought you know we could use the computer to sort of previs all of this. How and you? so I went, and by that point, digital productions had gone out of business, but I found a company named Omnibus, a Canadian company that had bought them up, and I made the proposition to them, and for $16,000, they actually worked with me, and and they said, uh, this is a really good idea. <laughs> this is like 1985. <laughs> so I did the first computer pre -biz. That's incredible. Yeah. That's and, uh, amazing. And, and the, the funny part is, Richard Edlam was the visual effects supervisor on the show. And years later, he's doing a uh, <laughs> he's doing a, a pitch to the uh, he's doing a pitch to the producers guild on the history of computer on, on digital previs, and he said, "And I invented digital previs in 1987 on blah blah whatever picture it is." And Neil Krepla, who was the DP on the second unit <laughs> that we did for the Voyager Fly, said, "No, you didn't. Jim Bissell did it in 1985 on the Voyager Fly." <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't even know how, how you knew to do that or how, I mean, oh, you're just. Well, it was, it was just logisticals, it, logistics. It, I mean, remember, you're designing a flying sequence and you're using stunt doubles suspended, you know, on big cranes with big wires and you have to design ways to obscure the wires, you know. Right, happen. right. Because you can't, at that point, there's no computer erase and line removal. There's, there's no computer anything. And so it has to all be part of the design. So I'm looking at that, and then I'm also figuring, we're using uh, what was called a, uh, what was it? Uh, they use them now all the time in sporting events and everything else, but uh, it, oh. it's a... It was the uh, computer version of the Steadicam, only it's in the air with all these... The uh, wires? Yeah. And uh, and the, the big problem was that required these four pylons in the set area, and you had to figure out what you could shoot when and when, when they were going to cast shadows up right over your, mm -hmm. your, your set, as well as the crane that's flying the stunt people around. So all of it had to be really intricately engineered. And so by being able to pre-visit, and I did it with, uh, you know, just... They were rasterized gra uh, graphics. You could look at what the storyboard, would, you know, in real time, what the shot was going to be, and then look at the plan and see where it was going to be and calculate what time of day you had to shoot it so you didn't get shadow problems. You're genius. So it made perfect sense. <laughs> it made perfect sense. But, but when you explained it to, like, the director and the DP, were they on board or were they... 
Oh yeah, they were. Uh, that, well, they. Uh, I, I had to explain it more to the producer, who fortunately was Dick Bain, who I got him the job. That's the first job he had as a producer. So I said, I think this is going to really help us and and uh, and make the shooting a lot more efficient. And uh, and so he was. He sprang sprang for the sixteen grand to go ahead with it. Well, thank God. It was very. Um, cause it was like 86, so I was, uh, I'm not sure to tell you how old I was, Six, seven, eight, nine. I was like 10 years old, and so to me, it was like, almost like a kid's movie, but a, but a, like a teenager movie that I just wanted to be a part of. I wanted a friend who could fly, <laughs> yeah. and, and I feel like that film was on, um, we didn't have HBO. We had like Prism, which was like the fake HBO back east, and it was on all the time. I don't know if they got the rights to that movie or whatever, but I feel like I watched that movie a million times. I mean, that and like Flight of the Navigator, those movies. I don't know why they were just on all the time on this cable network. So I've seen it a million times. I didn't rewatch it because I was like, oh, I know that movie, but pretty amazing that you were the first one to do that that's amazing the um you know that that was also the number one picture uh, when it when it came out on uh, vhs it was number one picture in canada for years really yeah it's it's uh, and i know a lot of i had a neighborhood kid here who just he must have watched it 25 times yeah he loved that film and i i had an interview with a director about two weeks ago and he was just saying you know Sorry, E.T., okay, 300, okay, Christian, <laughs> okay, but boy, who could fly? Who could fly? Yeah. But you know what's really weird on the um, on the trailer that they show? I have uh, Amazon Fire, and you basically you call up any movie you want, and you could watch the trailer, or see if you could watch it. Um, the trailer's super weird. It's it's like kids in their high school hallway, and they're all talking about the one kid. But they never show Blair Underwood. They never show the chick. They don't, or Fred Savage. They don't show Fred Savage. It's just lockers. You're just watching lockers. And wow. I'm, it's the weirdest thing to me. You got, it's, I was like, well, cause I, I was like, oh, let me just watch the trailer. And it was lockers. <laughs> I was so pumped. That's bizarre. Yeah. No, no. Well, Nick's, Nick's still a very good friend of mine. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, sorry. Um, it's cooking here. <laughs> um, yeah, Nick. Uh, I did. Uh, what did I do with him? I did. Uh, Boy, you could fly, and Dennis and Menace. Dennis and Menace had to be fun. Uh, it wasn't, unfortunately. I no. didn't get along with John Hughes. John Hughes fired me. <laughs> well, then it must have been really fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, I missed it. But. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he fired me two weeks into shooting, so uh, you know I designed the film, but uh, but it was sad to sad to leave because Nick was doing it and Dick was doing it. Oh, well, that's no. Yeah, those things happen. It happens. I think it happens to the best of us, really. <laughs> I don't think you're. I don't think uh, you have a story till you've been fired. <laughs> no. It, uh, well, the other movie I got fired from was uh, The Sixth Day. It was Roger Spottiswood, who was just sort of a troll. <laughs> um, anyway, he you know he waited until I'd finished designing the film, and then he fired me. And uh, sort of like my heart had been ripped out of my chest. Years later, Robert Ellsworth, who's a good friend of who we were talking about, you know, and I've done four or five, maybe six films with Robert. And uh, Robert was when he, Robert shot Rogue Nation, Mission Impossible, Rogue oh, yeah. Nation, and Roger asked him who, who and he had worked with Roger on. Uh, the one Bond movie that Roger had directed. So Roger asked him to rent his place because he needed the he needed the income. <laughs> so he went over to go take a look at it, and uh, and they're talking, and Roger says, "Well, what are you working on?" And he said, "Mission Impossible." Who's 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 this? Who's that? Who's your production designer? He said, "Jim Bissell." And he goes, "Oh, Jim Bissell, oh, lovely fellow, lovely fellow," and <laughs> Robert who. He was, you know, it's very straightforward. He went, you fired him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Roger went, I did? <laughs> oh, I couldn't tell. No, 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 
He's a lovely fellow. Lovely fellow. What the hell is that? Does he even remember who he's talking about? What is he doing? Wow. Well, you made quite an impression on him, at least. <laughs> was, uh, was, was Rogue Nation tough? Seems like a tough movie. It was a really, really difficult movie. And, um, and you had a question here that said... Let's see here. I know. I feel like my question seems so novice. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's all right. No, the question was, oh, record store built? Yes. Yeah. Everything was a build. We built everything, and we had no time to build it because we didn't have a script. We had no script. What? My, the mandate from, uh, from Chris McQuarrie was, find me locations that invite action. And if I had a dime for well, every time he said that to me, I'd be a rich man right now. Well, I don't know. Can't <laughs> That's what actors he's, he's, are for. <laughs> Well, the thing is, um, he's actually a brilliant writer in the sense that he's, he said he made his fortune as a fixer. You know, mm. he goes in and well, fixes, fixes broken scripts because he's a structuralist and he really understands this dramatic structure extraordinarily well. But he had a lot of trouble generating original material. And what he really wants is for someone like me or anybody to go out and basically write the scene for him. <laughs> so he can say what's wrong with it and fix it. <laughs> so he can inevitably always be the problem solver. Well, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. It was, but, but it didn't make the process extremely, extremely difficult because once you, he would push things up to the last, last minute. And we just didn't know, you know, in order not to shut the company down, uh, it was you had to build everything really fast to come up with ideas really, really fast. But do you have day. the money to do it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, of it, course it, they don't. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a different ball game when you're under pressure and you have the money, and then it's almost easier when you don't have the money because you're like, well, this is the best we can do. <laughs> yeah. When you have the money, you're like, oh shit. Now we gotta, gotta get it done. There's you no gotta excuse. do something, and you can't embarrass yourself. Yeah, there's no excuse. There's, there's no... no excuse. No, and and you know it's funny because I I had done two movies with Tom before. I'd done Ghost Protocol, right, as well as Jack Reacher, which I like Chris that. directed. I like Jack Reacher. I like that yeah. movie. It was, a, it was. I thought it was a good looking. I mean, Caleb Deschanel. I uh, yeah. I worked with okay. him on one episode of Bones because his daughter was in it, but he, yeah. he did an episode of Bones and he was just He's delightful. a brilliant cinematographer. Yeah. And, uh, such a nice guy. And, and also Caleb shot Spider-Man too. Oh, beautiful. He's so, it's, he's, and yeah. he's a really super nice guy. I just remember that. Oh, he's really, really lovely. And his work is amazing. And, and he's, he told me that, uh, that the, the Attic was one of his favorite sets of all time. The Attic in, in the... In spider -Man. In spider -Man. Yeah, that whole and the 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 dusting of it when everything's dirty and all the fairies coming in and out and making little footprints and all of the the death dressing and the oh, I just loved it. It was yeah. so great. It's no, so, it was so that's so that's uh, probably one of uh, Jan's so layered greatest greatest accomplishments. It's really really beautifully done. Yeah, it's it's beautifully done. I mean, so layered. <laughs> now did you have a lot of prep on that one it was odd we had a lot of prep but we didn't have a lot of prep we were the, we were constantly going through rewrites and not knowing where we were going to shoot it which is oh. why you, you can see Krista Monroe is listed as an art director primarily because we thought we might do it here in, in the US so we were, and our initial preparation was with the US crew mm. and that's the same the same thing is true with Ghost Protocol Krista started that up and then, and then we moved to Vancouver, okay. and this, and then in Spider's case, we moved to Montreal, and uh, and uh, at least on Mission Impossible, Ghost Protocol, I was able to then reassign Krista to the Prague, the Prague work. So she uh, and Helen Jarvis took over in Vancouver as supervising art director. Is it? Um, it's incredibly difficult when you're designing a feature in different locations around the world and I, I mean mission impossible ghost protocol i think i designed on an airplane mostly everything i did was on my laptop on an airplane because i was constantly looking for i was in india i was in all sorts of different places just trying to scout locations is, and we didn't have that much time is that although but there's a lot of pressure isn't it great 
the <laughs> great like traveling and getting to see places, There's, but not really. Oh, that that part I love. Yeah. But I, I, I'd have to say because of the the schedule pressures, I re, I remember on Mission Impossible, I had not been home. I had worked seventy eight days straight, not a not a day off, and I had not been home for that amount of time. Oh, and I had awesome. finally scheduled a weekend where I could fly into Los Angeles on a Friday and then go back up to Vancouver on a Sunday night and be able to see my wife and kids for a day and a half. Oh. And Tommy Harper called me up and said, no, you've got to go back to Prague or you have to, you have to go to Moscow. And I almost broke down and cried. Cause it, it was just like, I can't do it. It just, you know, it was so hard. Uh, so much. It, because it's non-stop. It's not like non-stop. it's not like you're sightseeing. You are you're going to locations, but you're not sightseeing. You're not like you might get a good meal, <laughs> but it's yeah. not a vacation at all. No, no, no. And I think you know that's one thing that's uh, that's important for a lot of people to realize is it's it's such an endurance test. Absolutely. You know you have to you have to take good care of yourself physically because you're gonna if you don't you're gonna get sick. Yeah. And the mental, I find, uh, and I've, I've had a lot of people, like the couple days after you end the show, you usually get sick. You usually get yeah. a cold. Usually something creeps up on you because you just release so much, I think, when we're done these projects, that your your barrier comes down. And then, like, I swear it happens uh, to friends and all of my colleagues all the time we always say like oh yeah my show ended now i'm sick <laughs> yeah it just happens fortunately, fortunately i've been able to avoid that on the over the past 20 years or so i mean i used to when i was early in my career i used to have the same problem yeah a lot of people do but where was the opera in um rogue nation well the exterior the was exterior. of course the vienna opera Oh, it's in Vienna. I didn't. Uh, yes, I didn't it's the Vienna Opera, and uh, and what we shot there was the exterior, as well as the lobby, which is absolutely stunning. Yeah, well, yeah. And then the the interior, it's all built. Wow. Do you know? It really reminded me of Foul Play. Do you remember that Chevy oh. Chase movie? Like when they're oh. and even the opera song and like the the timing and everything. I thought. Oh my God! All of these scaffolding and the all of the theater and the ropes and everything. This must have been a shooting nightmare. Well, that's why we built it, you know, so we could design it and build it. It was a shooting nightmare, but it was yeah. still less of one that, than if we'd shot into a, in a real location, because right. everything was specific to the shots. And and, the- uh, and and oddly enough, that that's one of the feathers that I stick in my cap as a as a designer, which is. Because we were representing, despite the fact that was not shot at the Vienna, at the, uh, Vienna Opera it. House, it was a, a set. Nonetheless, it represented, in order to sign the location agreement, the Vienna Opera had set approval. They did not want anything. They also had voice approval on all the actors who sang because they didn't want anything coming out that looked less than their standards. Wow. Are those so I've, des- I've designed Turin Dot for it. There you the, go. Yeah. The, the <laughs> gotten it approved so I'm, I'm very happy with it there you go that's back to your theater your theater days <laughs> that's amazing is that well that leads me to the my my question that i usually try to end on of what what are you watching what have you seen anything good lately i guess the dig is uh <laughs> is one of them but anything yeah, the else? Dig is great um <clears throat> You know, I just uh, I love to I love to watch uh, you know, I love to see what my peers are doing. Yeah. And uh, and I love to, especially if there's anything really interesting or innovative. I, I you know I I get really bored with all the the sort of flashy, very colorful, garish kind of stuff that is just yeah. sort of the uh, beat your head, beat beat your audience over the head with you know art direction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I really like art direction that has a, has a has a real subtle, <clears throat> not, not real subtle. I mean, you know, the bottom line is this: if we do our jobs right, you know, if we design it correctly, if it's decorated correctly, if it's if we create these uh, these environments for the action to take place in that are 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 done properly, then nobody notices it. Oh yeah, 
or they think no, it no, was nobody real. Knows it because you can't imagine it any other way. Yeah. If, if you've really thought it through and created the right environment, it's just like, well, of course that's what it is. And everybody just assumes it was there. Yeah. I think about that, like the wire to me, like that dirt, dirt, gritty Baltimore. I'm like, they just went into this crack house, right? There's no way. <laughs> it's just so, to me, I know it's, it's that dirty, gritty, but I just always think of the wire of like, I think, I don't know. And I, I know we go into plenty of locations and you're like, oh, thank God that was there. Or, you know, this conference table was there and we played off of that. But Yeah. Having uh, people who say like, "Oh, what hospital was that?" or "What, what room was that?" and you're like, "No, no, no, we built that." That's that's the compliment to me always. Yeah, yeah. my my favorite compliment to, to the work that me and my team did was on a movie called Tin Cup. Oh, I know. Yeah. Tin Cup was fun, but uh, but we could not find a driving range, and so <laughs> I, I I I posited to uh, to Ron Shelton the director. I said, "Look." You know, the, the character is incredibly anachronistic. You know, he's a real throwback to the a 50s kind of guy. I said, why don't we just say that, you know, as when his fortunes went south and he, and he, got, he dropped off the tour, you know, his fortunes sort of matched the town's fortunes. You know, the, the town got bypassed by an interstate and all the, you know, all the restaurants on the local route that went through the town, you know, went bust. And what he did was uh, he, he bought a 50s diner just outside the town and turned it into a driving range. And that reflects his character. You know, he's just this 50s kind of anachronistic, you know, male kind of guy. Oh, yeah. And uh, and so Ron said, brilliant, let's do it. So we designed this nice 50s thing. Supervising our director on that was Gabe Buckley. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, it looked great. And we built it. And two things happened. One was the first day of shooting, the sound guy who I'd worked with many times before came up to me and said, you lucky son of a bitch. You found like the perfect location. And I went, it's not a location, dude. It's a, it's a set. And he it's went, build. you're kidding me. You're kidding me. And, he, and I, I showed him the wild walls and he went, holy shit. Then we had this guy in a pickup truck, second day of shooting comes driving by and he goes up to one of the PAs, you know, he just sort of pulls over and the PAs are holding traffic. And he says, uh, what are y'all doing here? And he said, uh, the PA said, well, we're making a movie. And the guy said, I was wondering when somebody was going to take that old diner and turn it into something. <laughs> <laughs> he had never been there. He'd never known. <laughs> Gosh, I, I, from listening to your stories, I think one thing that strikes me so much is how, I mean, obviously designers are creative, but how in depth you seem to be with researching this character in their minds. Not like, like you've come up with so many things that you've described to me of like, well, they would do this or they would do that. And it's not it's not surface things like you've gone very deep into these characters to design their worlds. And I mean, I I appreciate listening to that so much because we all, I think we all try to do that, but the stories that you've told me here is like, uh, we create dreamscapes and they, and they come from the situations that our characters go through. And if we don't create, if we don't do that, if we don't do that homework, then they don't match the environment that they're in. I... You know, really, ultimately, what we're doing is we're telling the story of somebody who goes through a transition. It's, that's always what a, a protagonist does. And what is the transition that they're going through? You know, like you and I were talking about earlier on, E.T. You know, it's Elliot's transition from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Elliot's transition from uh, magical thinking to rational thought. And so you have to have the adult world represented and you have to have his world represented in, col- in a colorful way. And you have to look at the transition and you can't do that unless you really think about what are this, what are these people going through and what's the environment that sort of represents what they're going through at all, as well as provokes it so that the audience can feel like they're going through it with them. You seem to also work with people who like embrace that input. Like, is, well, that's why they hire me. I mean, I sit there and blather on and on about this stuff, and, and they go, oh, yeah, well, that sounds like it could be fun. But okay. uh, that, that's what they hire me for is because, you know, that's, that's, my, that's my take on it. That's how, I, that's how I create these environments. I don't just go, this will be cool and that will be cool. Because well, yeah. 
if you do that, then you just got a hodgepodge, you know, a little oleo of, of environments that sort of look cool, but you don't have any clue as to why they're there. Is, is there any, uh, is there any <laughs> film that you wish you designed? A ton. Um, God. Not that I wish that I had designed. I, you know, I mean, I guess there's, there's some stuff that I wish I had the talent to design, you know, well, yeah. uh, you know, um, and, um, but I can only design films the way that I, I, you know, I bring myself to it and I bring my, my, uh, my experience and my, my expertise to it. But, um, you're going to make me think about that. Uh, I, I mean, I often, I always wonder if like, God, would I, I, I wouldn't have made those decisions and look, look how perfect it was that someone decorated it this way. And I wouldn't have done that. I'm, I suck, but, like, but I no, would have I gone a different I way. I some great English designers. I love, I love uh, John Box, for instance. I love what he did with Clockwork Orange. I just yeah. thought, wow, that's an amazing show. And, 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 you know, really looking into the future. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, in such a, I mean, it was prescient in many ways. Uh, it's hard and, to and, do. It's hard to do because you, you almost have a box that you're in, that you're trying to create something. You, you set these little limits for yourself and everything. It's hard to do when you have to, I think, do future stuff. Like you were talking about all the research you did for the spaceship on, um, on Midnight Sky, like, not that it's a box that constricts you, but you created this language that then you you stuck to in your design. And I mean, I'm sure with Clockwork Orange too, like they made up rules of like, well, it would be like this and no, it can't be like that. Like, I think that's uh, a good and bad thing when you try to like get away with doing future stuff. Or creating yeah. things that aren't uh, everyday normal. I, can, I mean, you know, they're both Stanley Cooper films, but Clockwork Orange is one, and the other one is Ken Adams' work on Doctor Strangelove. Oh, so cool. You know, the, the War Room is just like, oh my God, that's it. You know? <laughs> and everybody want, you know, it, it's funny because afterwards people would come to the White House or come to the Pentagon and say, "I want to see the War Room." Right. You know, and it, you know, it doesn't exist. You know, it's. Oh no. It's, no, I, it's so funny because having I done it, I, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, I get a lot of stuff from, and I and I did do an homage to the War Room in Cats and Dogs. You know, we you know we, we did a War Room <laughs> right. that uses the big circular table and the Ken Adam screens on all sides. You know, it's we did that purposefully, just a you know just a, t a tip of the hat to Ken Adam and, and Stanley Kubrick. But uh, <laughs> but uh, that a lot of people you know keep saying, well, where was that parking garage in Mission Impossible? You know, Ghost Protocol. I said, well, it didn't exist. You know, right. it's a set. So we, we made it up. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, no way, you know. No, it's, it's it's made up, but it looks really appropriate. Oh, well, yeah. I would have I would have thought it was a parking structure you found. <laughs> no, it's, it's actually the most expensive set I think I've ever worked on. It's a, it was a $5 million set. Oh, my God. Well, I <laughs> I, I can assume why, but Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, there's three, there's three, three and a half stories of yeah. steel and hydraulics, and it's, it's a big set. <laughs> Is that too uh, so much input with like stunts and choreography and how this scene is going to play with the director and cinematographer and how the light shafts are going to come in and whatever? Well, oh, plus it just didn't exist. Yeah. yeah. It was based on it was based on not a parking garage but a car storage facility in Stuttgart, Germany, which is built by Volkswagen, oh. where their, their, uh, their merchandising hook is this. You know, the, the, uh, these Volkswagens roll off the assembly line, and as soon as they're finished, as soon as they, they, you know, the cars are finished and their odometers are set, they're lifted up by a spatula, and they're placed on these conveyor belts, and they're stored in this giant uh, facility. Yeah. And so people go to the showroom and they say, I want this, this, and this, and this. And then they find where that car is stored and these two towers. And a spatula comes, picks it up, lifts it down, brings it down on a conveyor belt, and delivers it to them with zero miles on the odometer. That's awesome. Yeah, but that's what it's based on is something like that. And then we made up our own sort of like, you know, 
in Mumbai where things are so uh, crowded, they have this mechanized uh, parking garage, and this is how it works. And it, everybody goes, yeah. I mean, I even saw comments on, on the web, which was, yeah, I've been to that parking garage. <laughs> right. like, it doesn't exist. <laughs> you thought you have. Yeah. You liar. <laughs> and not only that, but the exterior was shot in Vancouver. I mean, oh, well. Vancouver looked like, you know, Mumbai. So it was just like, come on. That is the magic sometimes. Uh, I forget what. I, uh, decorator just posted uh, something on Instagram of like the m movie magic. And it's one location is the exterior. Another location was the hallway. And then the set was the room. And she's just like, look how we weaved all this together that it just looks like. We were here in one spot, but <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the magic. That's, that's the magic, that's, that, that, and that's that's where it's really important for the designer to have a really good relationship with the directors because you got to you got to look at the techniques for tying all that stuff together to make it seamless, and you also have to you know there's also the component of weaving in visual effects and weaving in you know other camera effects that, that make it just look really seamless. You know, to think about all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be on the same page. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer because <laughs> I know you got things to do. Um, thank you so much, and I'm sure uh, Midnight Sky is gonna be uh, just in everyone's mind during the award season. So I hope, I hope, uh, little fingers crossed for you there. <laughs> but, oh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and it'll, it'll, it'll be what it is, you know, but it's, uh, it, I think it's a good looking movie. And oh, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. And like I'm, you said, I'm really proud of it. And like you said, it's, it's, you've sort of reinvented this spaceship, which I went back and, and looked at again while, uh, be between this pause of our conversation and God, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Cause I wanted to see like how you were talking about. The mechanism and the weight and how it shifted and everything just it's remarkable how you designed all of that to be so like i'm sure nasa could just pick it up and make it <laughs> like, no, i don't it, think so but you know space. it's funny because i did <laughs> send it to I mars a, uh, i had a geek out yesterday with uh, a fellow from the university of bristol in england and they're they they're they're a bunch of geeks who watch movies and just love to geek out over design and so i went over all this stuff with him and he said he has a he has a friend who is uh, an engineer who is going to go ahead and feed in all the information. Yeah, I mean, he was asking me about things like mass, how much, how much was it going to weigh, what kind of materials we're going to be using. And I went, uh, uh, I made this shit up. I don't know. I don't, I don't know but uh, you know, you can speculate. And I, I said the, the bottom line is we're going for it as light, lightweight a looking, you know, design as possible. Uh, but uh, he said, okay, well, well, we'll make that up and we'll figure it out. But he's, he's going to give me the design that the computer comes up with for an actually topologically uh, optimized exoskeleton and endoskeleton. That is so, it's so awesome. awesome. I, think it's great. <laughs> I can't wait to see what it looks like. I mean, we just made it up. But That is so awesome. I mean, but that's what's brilliant about film in general and, and you in a sense of like, Films inspire, like look, you know, uh, illustrations from the fifties, and then it becomes real, or things like that. Like two thousand one, all of the, all of these things are so inspiring to technical people. So, yeah, that's awesome. Oh, I hope it comes out. Like, mm -hmm. no, I can't wait. I'll send you a copy. No, oh, yeah, I'd love to see that. <laughs> um, thank you for letting me in on the middle of your day here <laughs> oh my pleasure i'm and glad, then, uh, so glad we finally got back together good luck with the project and thank you again so much this was you have no idea how many people i have told that i talked to the guy who did et <laughs> like, i would tell my mom about it she's like what et that was the first movie we took you to i go i know <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> so it's been it's been just amazing for me to have this opportunity to grab your ear so thank you Yes. Thank you, Kim. So and, nice. uh, have fun. Good luck. Okay. Thank you. I'm telling you, I have listened to this <laughs> interview many times. I think, I think I'm hoping that some of his genius just seeps into my ears and I become a better decorator or something. I don't know. 
but uh, mesmerized uh, by speaking with him and and uh, getting in to talk about the design of these movies that very much influenced me. So I can't thank him enough uh, for this. So what else? Um, on next week's episode, I don't have it yet. So <laughs> I'm either I'm either gonna score an episode with somebody who's nominated for an ADG award, or you get to listen to me uh, talk about Moxie. A film I did that came out on Netflix today. Well, it'll be yesterday for you. And uh, directed by Amy Poehler. And uh, production designed by Aaron McGill. Props by Gay Perillo. In fact, Gay and I have a date on Saturday night. We're going to watch the movie together. So that'll be so much fun. I um, actually just watched, uh, watched it when I got home from work. <laughs> after the boys went to bed. Because I want to see my work. You forget, I mean, we did it over a year ago. You forget what you did. It's, uh, I think it looks pretty good. I think I have nailed those teenage bedrooms, I'll tell you that. I dug deep. We dug deep in some teenage research. Not to get all Woody Allen on you, but, you know, we were asking girls for pictures. So, yeah, it worked out. I thought it looked good. I hope you got an earful. I'm Kim Mona for Decorating Pages. Summer is just around the corner, like fast, like it's coming up, I promise. Get your Stogie Floaty in time. Stogie Floaty Luxury Pool Floats, available now on Etsy and stogiefloaty.com. Welcome to Pro Tips for the Pros, brought to you by Floor and Decor Bailey's Crossroads. In this series, we'll explore essential advice for professional contractors to deliver outstanding renovation results. Let's dive in. Clear communication is key to a successful renovation. Keep the customer informed at every stage of the project, addressing any concerns or questions promptly to maintain trust and satisfaction. Thank you for joining us for this pro tip on planning thorough renovations. Stay tuned for more expert advice brought to you by Floor and Decor Bailey's Crossroads. A lot of people tolerate ordinary. Ordinary bathrooms, kitchens, entryways. Well, not on your watch. If you're a pro, you've got a new partner in town. Floor and Decor. From tile to wood to stone, Floor & Decor has more styles and job lot quantities of Schluter, Mape, Ladacrete, and other brands pros trust. Come see a whole new way to wow with Floor & Decor. Coming soon to Bailey's Crossroads.